Good morning. Praise God. For some reason, I'm nervous right now, but whatever. It is what it is. <laughs> uh, what, uh, what I want to talk to you about this morning is something that I read <coughs> Excuse me. Um, earlier today. Uh, I've talked a little bit about this before, but I think it has been on a Wednesday service. Uh, a few months ago, a movement started back in uh, my home country that churches started getting together and going to uh, the town mayors and they were asking them, we want to do 40 days of prayer and fasting. This island needs this. It's going down the drain. We need to get together and put this land in God's hand to make it better. <clears throat> this, one this one town started it, uh, and it was very successful. A lot of people went. People getting together, all kinds of denominations, uh, uh, Pentecostals and Evangelicals and Catholics and everybody. Was, they were all getting together because they all had the same goal. Put their trust in God's hand and put the island in God's hand to make the situation better because it's really bad. It's, it's, it's so bad that uh, I have made the decision that I don't want to go back ever, not even for vacation. And I love my island. But uh, other towns start to join and at some point, there were several that were doing it all at the same time, and it, it, it just kept growing and growing, and it's become very strong. Well, now this group of people, uh, they have come and said that they are going to sue every town that has participated in it because they're using government funds for religious purposes, which is not true. All that's happening is that mayors are signing a decree saying this town is going to participate in the 40 days of prayer and fasting, and they're allowed to use this specific venue. That's it. So they're <clears throat> they started sending letters to some of those towns, to, to the, the uh, city hall, saying we need you to provide a report on what were the results of your event. You can't measure that. What kind of an idiot would say that? Because uh, according to them, they're using this specific law that says that if there is a, some sort of institution uh, that follows some religious ideology that provides some type of social service, they need to have some sort of measurement of success. Well, Okay, if you want to measure success, how about the fact that all these people are all coming together at five in the morning and doing this, even though they have different ideas and opinions? That's success, you know? God's bringing everybody together. How about the fact that other people continue to do it and, and all that? So as I was reading that, uh, I started going through the comments in this, in this post, and it's, it's unbelievable the amount of ignorance that uh, people have and, and the comments that were there, all I, all I could do was just laugh because you can tell that people know nothing about God. They don't know who he is. They don't know his love, nothing. Uh, but that got me thinking about this scripture, and it's from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, uh, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. <coughs> And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So if this that they're doing is against the constitu Constitution, why did the first sentence of the Constitution say, we the people, trusting God, draft this Constitution? Isn't that a little bit uh, conflicting there? So. <clears throat> Then I kept reading some more, and the Lord gave me this other scripture, which is from Romans 
chapter 16, starting in verse 17, it says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent, as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. There's a song that we play here <clears throat> that is called Break Every Chain. And one of the lines says, there's an army rising up. That's what's happening right now. The people of God are listening to his call. And we are rising up. We're forming an army. And the devil is mad. And he doesn't like it. So he's trying to use whatever he can to bring us down. Every time something good happens, he tries to do something to break our faith. But we cannot allow him to do that. I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired of everything that he keeps trying to throw at me and, and, and you and everybody. So I say, let's continue to speak the word. Because when we speak that word, it gets him mad. And he continues to try and, and do whatever he wants to do. But when we stay strong and united and putting our trust yeah. in him, yeah. he's not going to defeat us. Right. I said it. <clears throat> so I'm still nervous, but <laughs> with that, anyone wants to share testimony or prayer request? <laughs> you look like you want to say, okay. temporary. And that's all it is. I mean, then 
single one of us at any given time is just absolutely awesome. And I am so thankful for the opportunity. Um, I'm thankful for a church that that doesn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's no criticalness. There's no pointing fingers. There's no, oh, well, I wonder what she's doing. I wonder what he's doing. Because, you know, it comes from the top down. God's not pointing his finger. God's not uh, trying to ridicule people because, because of what they do or don't do. But, you know, we are a living sacrifice unto God. When we accept him, he's us. I mean, we are him. And um, I'm just, I, I'm just thankful. I, I'm just so blessed. And um, sometimes even when I don't uh, realize it, and I'm just like, God's just, he's wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Last night, uh, Mark, uh, I would just love to share that uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Eastern Gate went up to clean the house of prayer. Go and take a step of faith to go and be on the walls of fear to be part of a 24-hour prayer burn, they call it. Um, the Lord told us specifically, go beyond the walls. <clears throat> Look in these walls to not remain in these walls. Um, the situation that you've been going through at work, and I firsthand have seen what you've been going through, the situation happening up in, in, in this place and stuff, um, <clears throat> reminded me specifically uh, just a couple sessions ago by the Lord there was a sermon, an awesome sermon uh, quote called The Eagle's Nest. And basically, I'll make it quick and short, but it's been when the baby chicks are starting to grow and they're supposed to fly, uh, they don't want to get out of this comfortable nest. So the mother eagle, in time, starts taking out all the fluff and the dust and all the, the comfortable stuff, and then pretty soon the thorns and the ticks and everything start coming out and making it very uncomfortable to, for them to remain because he wants them to get up and start soaring. So I believe the situation in your life you're facing right now has to do with the Lord making you uncomfortable where you're working at, that work environment and stuff is going to show it's nasty, but you just want to get up and fly away from it um, because he has a plan. And this plan is now being revealed to you, and it looks like it's opening wide up. So many, many fold things are coming through. Uh, the family situation, uh, he is healing. He will heal uh, because of your step in your faithfulness and your belief that he will heal, to start with, mm -hmm. and then second of all, to finish off the things that he is trying to get you to move into, the realm that he's moving into, mm -hmm. to take what you have preached here, to take what you have teached here, to take what you have experienced here, and take it from these walls, yeah. and start planning. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Yes, Sheila. <coughs> father's been involved with in an accident with a deer and we can't make another plane so I don't know how we're going to pay for this but to me the, the Lord's faithful mm -hmm. no one's gotten hurt there's never been any second party it's just always been through the cars mm -hmm. so I think the Lord that he's kept his hand upon I told the girls I said you guys don't know this maybe but I'm telling you what every time you guys get a new vehicle I pray over this I pray angels of mercy upon it mm -hmm. and every accident you kids have ever been involved in no one has ever gone to the hospital my vehicle back on the road and get my daughter a vehicle and <laughs> get these, this plane settled and move forward.
provide any, uh, even you would think that it's saying, well, there are more people going into schools and going, turning guns and shooting people and killing people. They, they want to blame it on the gun, like the gun got up by itself and <laughs> wandered into a school. It's the person carrying it. No different than a chainsaw. If you handle a chainsaw really dangerously, you're going to cut your arm off. You know? mm -hmm. But we, we just live in a world that we, we just, and I know it can be, we get so anxious for something to happen. Now you can imagine Saul, when he looked out and saw the Philistines and they were ready to attack, and Samuel said, wait till I get there. Mm -hmm. And Saul said, I can't wait. Looking with human eyes, looking as a military man. Yeah. He looked and said, I will sacrifice. I said to some people, I was thinking the separation of church.
church and state to a, a, a radical extreme, it reminded me of something that I read recently. It kind of was a joke. It says, uh, Bibles are allowed in prison, but not in schools. Maybe if they were allowed in schools, kids wouldn't have to read them in prison. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for letting us gather here this morning in your name, Lord. We continue to speak your word and agree with your promises, Father. We know that you have a plan and a purpose that you are going to be in here. Father, we thank you for all the testimonies that have been shared of your wonderful mercy and your faithfulness to us, for your healing, for your deliverance, for you saving us, Lord. And we are not serving of your mercy. Father, we declare right now that those that need healing are healed. In Jesus' name, we believe in the work of the cross, finish everything that it was said to accomplish. Father, in your word, it's a living word. We declare, Father, that those that are in need of your comfort, I need comfort right now by the Holy Spirit. You are showing your mercy, you are showing your love in them, you are revealing to them.
All right, announcements. Uh, Friday, October 10th, this coming Friday, 7 p.m., Eastern Gate House of Prayer. Uh, we'll go where the Lord leads. Amen. Amen. Uh, October 12th, that's Sunday. That's Sunday. Okay. Gideon's will be here. And October 24th, that's a Friday? Friday night. Yeah. Tom Stammen will be here, so if you can come and... Uh, be here. We're yes. Also, we're still going to be Do not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes and devours for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of the servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Uh, Don and Mark, would you mind taking the offering? worship.
sunsets free. children who are not running in the fullness of the Lord we call out to you now come to the knowledge of the Lord come to the knowledge of the Lord our children and grandchildren Lord
little longer than before. I want to lift my hands higher than before. I want to shout a little louder than before. I want to shout a little louder than before.
signifier. this body, Lord. Ignite this body. gather around, Lord, to hear clear words from your throne room, Lord, not the words of man, but the words of you, Lord, your words, Lord, that are not watered down. Prepare this pulpit, Lord, to clear, make a way for your word coming forth. Let us hear your heart. Let us hear your truths. Hallelujah, Lord. Let us gather.
thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for joining us in the midst of worship, Lord. That when we lift you up, that you will draw all men to you. That is our one true goal. To draw all men to you that they might know you. That know that you are good. That you are gracious. And that you are merciful. And that you are faithful. for your presence. Any you kids, if you'd like to uh, head downstairs, you can take your flags and tambourines if you'd like. We are uh, giving the children liberty and teaching them some cool moves with the uh, tambourines and flags, so great to see them worshiping with us, stepping out and learning how wonderful it is to praise the Lord, the joy that it brings us to praise him in whatever way. All right, well, um, being dense as I usually am, I've been praying since, I, I, I taught Wednesday, pastor called um, last Monday, and nobody ever wants to get a call where tragedy has struck your pastor's family and they're not able to minister. And I was praying, I'm like, Lord, what do you, what do you even say? And so for Wednesday, the Lord said, tell them they are precious. They do not know or they would not take their life is so cheap. So tell them they are precious. So I did that. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm like, Lord, what do you want me to tell them? He said, tell them they are precious. And I said, well, I already did that. <laughs> tell them they are precious. Tell them they are precious. God wants you to understand undoubtedly without any question that you are precious. You are precious to him and you came at such a high price. So I'm gonna spend just a minute to tell you how precious you are. Then I'm gonna spend the rest of this morning talking about the one who calls you precious and the price he paid. So the definition of precious, costly, excellent, brightness, valuable, Weighty, rare, splendid, glorious, weighty, and influential. We are created in God's image. Genesis uh, chapter 1, 26 through 28 in the Message Bible said, God spoke. Let us make human beings in our image. Make them reflecting our nature. So they can be responsible for the fish of the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. So God created human beings. He created them God-like, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female, and God blessed them. Prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge. Be responsible for the fish in the sea and the birds in the air and every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. We are created God-like to reflect the very nature of God. We are his most precious creation, his children, yes. sacred. A friend at work who's a Catholic, which I'm learning that I shouldn't be judgmental towards all Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> she said sacred, she teaches her children, she teaches a lot of children in their church. Sacred is too precious to be interfered with. That is powerful to me. You are too precious to be interfered with, yes. to be interfered with in any way. In Psalm 119, verses 13 through 16, again in the message. Oh yes, you shaped me first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. Thank you, high God. You're breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made, bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you, 
the days of my life all prepared before I'd even lived one day. He had a plan for you before you ever came on the scene, every one of you. I, it blows my mind how many people since Adam and Eve, how many individual, unique, individual children. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Jeremiah says, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Oh, his love, his faithfulness over and over when we, when we get distracted, when we turn away, oh, he calls us back with his love. He proves himself to us over and over again. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, it says, we are his treasured possession. In Isaiah 49, 16, it says, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. And the Amplified says, indelibly imprinted, tattooed a picture of you on the palm of his hand. How big are his hands that every one of us, how big are his hands that every man and woman ever that graced the face of the earth is imprinted on the palm of his hand. And he sees every one of them. In Luke 12, 7, it says, even the very hairs of your head are numbered. In the beginning and the end, he knows them all. <laughs> and that we are far more valuable than many sparrows. In Psalm 17, 8, it says, we are the apple of his eye. Are we understanding how precious we are to God? In Titus 3, 3 through 5 in the Amplified, it says, For we also were once thoughtless and senseless, obstinate and disobedient, diluted and misled. We too were once slaves to all sorts of cravings and pleasures, wasting our days in malice and jealousy and envy and hateful, detestable, hating one, one another. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior to man, as man, appeared, he saved us. Not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but because of his own pity and his own mercy. By the cleansing, the bath of the new regeneration, the Amen. new birth, yes. and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. He has done it all. He has done it all. And after all of this, his creative work, after man created God in his very own image, man chose knowledge over life and was immediately cut off from God's presence. But God wasn't finished. He didn't just give up on man when we threw away our access to him, when we were tricked. God had a master plan that even Adam and Eve couldn't screw it up. They couldn't stop it. God has searched through every generation to find those individuals, those people who would believe his promises and who would step out in faith and who would follow after him. He started with Adam and Eve, and he's still searching today. He is looking for those characters in his story, the players in his master plan for redemption of all mankind, that everyone might be saved. How do we know when we play in God's role in, in someone else's life? How do we know when we're the one person God put in their path to say, God is good, God loves you, God died. Jesus came and died for you. Every single person that responds to his call in faith has paved the way for Jesus Christ to come and is still doing so today. Look at the ancestors of Jesus. Abraham and Sarah. Sarah laughed at God's promises. You, she was 99 years old, 90. I think Abraham was 99, she was 90. The angel came and said, when I come back next year, you'll have a son. She laughed, but she had a son. Moses, who hid in a tent in the wilderness for 40 years, hiding, came and, and stood up to Pharaoh and millions of Jews redeemed. Jacob, the usurper, the trickster, the liar, who, who stole his brother's birthright and tricked him. Oh, not Jacob, Israel the forefather of the 12 tribes of Israel. Ruth and Boaz. Ruth wasn't even a Jew. She was a Moabite. And Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. Oh, the kinsman redeemer. 
Our God is a kinsman redeemer that goes and saves the line clear back and the blood flows both ways, both forward and back. He has redeemed all of his kinsmen. And David and Bathsheba, a man after God's own heart who killed the husband of a woman because he wanted her. He lusted after her. But that was where Jesus, that is the line that Jesus came through. Bathsheba was a Hittite. She was an ite. That's the enemy. But God said, no, I will come and I will use this woman as a lineage. All of these characters, all of these players in the story are testimonies of God's grace, of God's mercy, if we'll just trust in him. And he is still searching today. He needs those who will step out in faith and just believe he is not finished. Each one played a part, no matter how great or how small, in God's eventual plan to purchase salvation for all mankind. They paved the way for Jesus to come, to shed his blood, and to lay down his life. The great cost of salvation. We all know the cost of salvation. God knew the cost of salvation before he ever created the heavens and the earth, but he created it anyway. He created us anyway. When we think back to Gethsemane, when Jesus was praying and he wept blood, what was it that held him together? He knew they were coming. He knew that if he stayed in that spot, that he, that he was coming. It was his time. His hour had come. Oh, Father, if this yes. cup could pass, if there's any other way, yes. but nevertheless, thy will be done. But what was it that held him there but the Father's love? Amen. Luke 22, verses 40 through 46. Thank you, Lord, for your perfect love. Jesus. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. And in Matthew it says he fell on his face and he prayed. Saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And, they, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him in spirit, says the Amplified. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was coming and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. God's perfect love, God's perfect love in that moment came and encouraged Jesus, strengthened him in the spirit. That's how God strengthens us, is in the spirit. He doesn't come and make our flesh feel more comfortable. He comes and he gives us a security a presence, that sense that we're not alone. We're not alone in this, that he has it all under control. And he gives us glimpses of the other side. So many times we're stuck in a situation and we can't see past it. And that's when we need to go and look with the eyes of the Spirit and hear with the ears of the Spirit and say, God, help me see the other side of this. I know that you have gone before me and made the way. Show me. And he will, and he will, he will let you know without a doubt that he is with you. Perfect love. Matthew 27, verses 22 through 26. Perfect love. Perfect love. Unfailing love. Matthew 27, verses 22 through 26. Perfect love. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. 
And the governor said, why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out more, saying, let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a turmoil was made, he took water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this person, of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. And then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged, scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Do we understand that even in their hatred, they didn't even know what they were saying. Let his blood be on us. What does his blood do? It doesn't condemn. Even the people who begged and cried and made a, a, a turmoil, right? Rioting, rioting for his death. They said, let his blood be on us. They didn't even know what they were saying. His blood heals. His blood saves. His blood, they're crying out for his blood, is the only thing that will redeem them in the end. It's his blood. That is how good God is. Do we understand that even those who killed him, who wanted him tortured and murdered, he still saved them. He put those words in their mouth. They didn't know what they were saying. Let his blood be on us and our children. His blood only does one thing. It never, ever does it curse. There's no bad. There's no ill. There's no curse. There's no death. There's nothing in that blood but healing power, salvation, resurrection. His love is perfect. Do we understand the completeness, the totality, the perfection of God's great love for his most prized possession, his creation, his treasure? Do we understand how powerful God's grace is? in God's mercy, in his unfailing love, in his desire to reconnect with his people, he set forth his plan of perfect redemption. But he wasn't taking any chances this time. He came. God himself came in the flesh of a man. Fully God, fully man. And he said, just like with Abraham, I'm not taking any chances. I am going to covenant with myself. I'm going to pay the price myself once for all. Once for all, taking no chances. We can't screw it up. We can't do anything to unearn it. We didn't earn it to begin with. God came himself as the man Jesus Christ, the perfect player in his plan, so he could be one with us once again. God came in the man Jesus, and he paid the price for our sin with his blood and his death. Blood to cleanse, to cover, to atone, as if it never happened. To atone. Forgiveness, as far as the east is from the west, you can't ever connect the two. It didn't say north and south. There's a north pole and a south pole. It's as far as the east is from the west, never to be seen again, as if it never happened. Do we understand that it's as if it never happened? We get so hung up on our imperfections. It's not about us. It's never been about us. It is now all about Jesus. Yes. He has done it all. Yes. All we do is say thank you. And his death. His death to bring newness of life. Resurrection life. The life that never ends. There is no death ever again. He took the final death yes. once for all. Yes. Only that which is dead can be resurrected. Why do we fear death? That is simply the, the next step to resurrection. Yes. The old man is dead and you are resurrected a new creature. Yes. Jesus, the son of God, the son of man. That is why we praise his name. Yes. That is why we exalt his name above every name. Uh, uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 5 verse 9. In the Amplified, it says, And now they sing a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to break the seals that are on it. For you were slain, you were sacrificed. And with your blood you purchased man from God, unto God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And in the message, I love how it says it in the message. So I looked, and there surrounded by, by, surrounded by the throne, animals and elders, was a lamb slaughtered but standing tall 
seven horns he had and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He came to be... He came to the one seated on the throne, and he took the scroll from his right hand. The moment he took the scroll, the four animals and the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the lamb. Each had a harp, and each had a bowl, a gold bowl filled with incense, the prayers of God's holy people. He stores them. He stores our prayers, and they go before the throne. And they sang a new song. Worthy. Take the scroll, open its seals, slain, paying in blood. You bought men and women. You brought them back from all over the earth, brought them back for God. And then you made them a kingdom, priests for our God, priest kings to rule over the earth. Church, there is only one song left to sing, the new song, the song of the Lamb, who he is, what he has done. That he alone is worthy. Don, you mentioned our worship is most powerful when we worship the man, Jesus. Yes. Our Savior, the only begotten of the Father. Fully God and fully man. The perfect spotless lamb slain for the sins of all mankind. Past, present, and future. That's why we praise him. The man, Jesus Christ. That is worship. That is high praise. Anything less is man's effort to entertain God and to entertain the church. But it falls short and it does not please God. It is the song of the lamb, or as Mike said, it's the song of the lame. Yes. It's one of the two. That's the only song there is left to sing. Yes. That's new creation. So we were purchased with a price, a very high price. We are no longer our own. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, whom you have received as a gift from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price, purchased with the preciousness, and paid for, made his own. So then honor God and bring glory to him in your body. So what did Jesus purchase with his life and his blood? A whole new creation a new race, a new generation, one that will never die, one that can never be cut off from God again, the born-again, spirit-filled believer. You can't sell it. You can't trade it for a bowl of stew. You can't be tricked into throwing it away and choosing knowledge over life. There's even a song, you can't, you can't uh, win a golden violin contest and the devil gets your soul. Yeah. They only do that in Georgia. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it makes a great song, but it's not true. We can't do anything. We can't screw it up. He made it foolproof. He came himself to make sure that man couldn't goof it up again. Yes. God's redemption, his salvation of man is complete. How else could God say Jesus on the cross is, is finished? It's complete. It's complete. First Peter uh, chapter two verse nine, Sheila. First Peter chapter two verse nine. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I love how the Amplified says it. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchase, special people, that you may show forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and the perfections of God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's our purpose. We're ambassadors. We're messengers. We're the lamp to light up the darkness, yes. to carry out the rest of the plan of salvation yes. until the return of Jesus and the new heaven and the new earth. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 7 in the New Living Translation says, But this precious treasure, this light and power that now shines within us, is held in perishable containers, that is, in our bodies. 
so everyone can see that our glorious power is from God and is not our own. The light that shines, the spirit that heals, the spirit that saves, it's not us. We're just the vessels. But we have to open our mouth and let it shine. Our mouth, the word, is a lamp unto thy feet. you got to speak it. You can't think it. You have to speak it. Somebody has to hear it. Then it becomes a lamp. You know, speaking a kind word to somebody, they light up. It lights up. It changes the environment, changes the atmosphere. To speak God's word, to encourage somebody. What would have happened when, they, when these kids, you know, they, 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 they can't see past it. They can't see past it. They only see that death is the only option. What if someone could have been there to say, let me just pray for you. Let me just tell you how precious you are. I'm telling you, Craig didn't like it, but I grabbed his chin. I said, you are precious. I want you to know that you are precious to me. You are precious to God, your creator, your heavenly father. And Jesus died for you. He died for you. And I want him to know it. Now, my teenager didn't like it when mom said, look me in the eyes. They need to be told. These kids need to know that they are precious. I told my husband. I told my coworkers. I thought I was crazy. I'm like, you are precious. We don't get told that enough. We get told a lot of junk, but we don't get told we are precious. Tell somebody, you are a child of God. You are precious. You have the highest value. God paid the highest price for you. Jesus came. Not because you're worthless. Not because you have no value. Not because there's no, no, nothing for you to be accomplished or gained in this world. Because you are precious. You are his prized possession. Oh, church. So many don't know that they are precious. They don't know. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to read this whole section from the message translation. Verses 5 through 16. Remember, our message is not about ourselves. We're proclaiming Jesus Christ, the master. All we are is messengers, errand runners from Jesus for you. It started when God said, light up the darkness. And our lives filled up with light. We talked about that moment. Everybody remembers that moment when God lit up the darkness in our lives. I remember it like yesterday. And I remember when I was baptized and I stood up and the pastor threw my hands in the air. I was transformed. I, was, I, I couldn't walk afterwards. It was like lightning from my fingertips to the tips of my toes. I was a new creature. God made sure that I understood that I was no longer the same woman I was when I got in that that hot tub. That's all it was, was a hot tub. It wasn't the water. It wasn't the tub. It wasn't the place I was. It was him. It was his spirit that said, you are mine. I have sealed you. I have set you apart. You are mine. And he filled our lives. And our lives filled up with light. And we saw and we understood God in the face of Jesus Christ, all bright and beautiful. If you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. I can do nothing. But with God, all things are possible. We carry this precious message around in unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not much to look at. We've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. What they did to Jesus, they do to us. Trial and torture, mockery and murder. What Jesus did among them, he does in us. He lives. Our lives are a constant risk for Jesus' sake which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. While we're going through the worst, you're getting on. You're getting in on his best. We're not keeping this quiet, not on your life. Just like the psalmist wrote, I believe it, so I said it. We say what we believe. And what we believe is that the one who raised up the master Jesus will just as certainly raise up you and me alive. Every detail works to your advantage and to God's glory. More and more grace, more and more people, more and more praise. 
So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, but on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the good times coming. The lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. I say that all the time. Things are not as they appear, church. Oh, if we could just see with the eyes of the Spirit, things are not as they appear. The things we see now are here today, gone tomorrow. Someone said that earlier. They are temporary, just fleeting moments. But the things we can't see will last forever, forever, forever. So what is our calling? To light up the darkness, to be messengers of light, to be messengers of grace. And when we light, when we will be the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he will manifest through our lives, and we put God's grace on display. Again, back to 1 Peter Chapter 2, verse 9 from the Amplified. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You display his perfection because you are made perfect in him. So put his perfection on display. Tell it forth, declare it. To show forth means to declare, to publish, to make known the goodness of God's grace by praising, proclaiming, and by celebrating the Lamb of God. And when we lift up the Lamb of God, God himself will manifest and draw all men to him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, everybody, you are dismissed in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Even wrapped up for noon. <laughs> Even wrapped up for noon. <laughs> Thank you.